My name's Dave DeBow, founder of MoneyPartnerFormula.com, and this show is built for everyday real estate investors who are actively doing deals and looking to scale using other people's money. So if you're an active real estate investor and you want to get featured on this show to talk about your own real estate and capital raising experiences, then just go to DaveInterviewsYou.com. Now let's get rolling with this episode and remember to subscribe for daily interview content. All right, guys, welcome to Property Profits Podcast. I'm your host, Bryce Kaminsky, filling in for Dave Dubow. And have you ever wondered how ethical real estate investing and property management intersect to redefine the industry landscape? Well, today, my guest, Robert Coldwell from Rentwell, is a seasoned investor with a unique approach focusing on workforce housing and emphasizing ethical practices. Join us as we delve into the world of real estate investing and management with a twist. Rob, welcome to the show. How are you today? Uh, good to be here. I hope the intro was to your satisfaction. Yeah, I think he, I, he, he, he nailed it. Awesome. Well, ChatGPT and me are great friends. And uh, as long as you give it the sauce, it'll make the soup. So when you look at Rentwell's focus and your focus, we were talking a little bit before the show about taking over units yes, and having challenges with like, you know, inevitably you're like, oh, I got this, these leftover tenants and maybe you don't feel super great about kicking out, like you said, the 96 year old veteran yes. who's been there for 20 years, pays his rent, but the cap rate is going to suffer if you keep them there. So let's touch on that a little bit and then we'll rewind the tape and we'll talk about how you really got started in this whole business. So tell us about your, your focus, because you are writing a book about this particular okay. procedure. So let us have it, man. Sure. The book's renting, renting well with uh, how to build a profitable management company without sacrificing your value. So for that 96-year-old veteran, what we're going to do, that was in a, still our tenant, God bless Ernie, well, that was in a six-unit building in Schwanksville, PA, and we, we got him, we did the major mechanicals. What we do, Bryce, to just back up a little bit is we buy the value add multifamily and we do usually I'm buying at fifty dollars a square foot, sometimes more. I'm getting assets at the end of the useful life. We put in 125 amps of power, usually mini splits or PTAC units, or you know, the full gas furnaces. We we update windows, roofs, like Everything I want to be done. My capex is done for thirty years. So for a, a scenario mm -hmm. like a uh, like a like a veteran, somebody elderly, fixed income, we will work with them to reach out to the family to see if the family can help at all. And let's say that the market rent is sixteen hundred dollars a month, and they're at eight hundred dollars. I will scale back some of the improvements in the apartment. Right. Usually I can scale back about 20,000 or so, and then we'll work with them to gradually step them up to maybe 50% where they were then mm -hmm. and see if they're willing to work within those confines. They have to be a good resident. They have to abide by the lease. They have to take care of the apartment and then take care of the community around them. So it's open dialogue. I was in a four unit building yesterday and uh, there was a uh, Older man, single, still working, and you know the electricity was jumped in the whole building. It was pretty dangerous, uh, you know, extension cords, and they're jumping the meter. and And I was honest with this man. I said, "Look, we're redevelopers. I am not going to give you a week's notice or even thirty days' notice. But chances are, I'm going to be renovating this apartment. It's really not. You have to be careful because you can't say it's not safe to be there." Mm -hmm. And he knows he knows what was going on because he's not getting an electric bill. So I just give somebody a heads up, and then I have concentration. I buy where I have existing concentration. Typically, I like to. I get economies of scale, and I have fifty other apartments within a mile of that one. Mm -hmm. So if I do have something that might be a good fit for them, I'll communicate with them. And I just find that if you treat people with respect, and you you speak honestly when it feels right. There's other scenarios where I would not have had that conversation. It could have become controversial. Maybe I don't buy the building and something happens and now they're going to go back to that current landlord and say, hey, what's going on? So we try to communicate. We try to think like, what would I want to have happen to one of my loved ones or myself if I was in this apartment and then treat people with respect? Awesome. Awesome. So 
you know, with all the units, the management company, um, you know, the underwriting and stuff like that, it doesn't happen overnight. You had to have started somewhere at the beginning. So tell us the origin story, you know, take us to the Marvel section where you become the superhero. What's the backstory? Where's the first move into real estate for you? Uh, red, red, rich dad, poor dad understood the difference between an asset and a liability and, and a balance sheet. Had some money saved when I graduated from college and put down $15,000, found a business partner. He put down 15000 It was 2005. We bought a quarter of a million dollar, five bedroom, three bath in a college town, and we rented it by the room. Mm. Now they call it co-living or house hacking. We just got roommates. We didn't have a name for it. Yeah, and yeah. And then it worked. And then I realized after a few months that, wait a minute, I could be renting this room out for $700 a month. Why don't I do that? I'll move home. Yeah. And then I rent it. And then I was actually making money versus just living for free. Mm -hmm. And then I bought the neighbor's house. And then I bought one around the corner. I did that neighbor's house on a lease purchase. Because again, in 2005, six, it wasn't what it was today. It was a little different. And I was able to get these assets that were around this college town, rent them by the room, and then I handled all the property management. And I feel I thought I knew property management. And you know, now what I run is not like you know what I knew 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, but that that is exactly how I got started. And I left a day job, which I was very passionate about uh, as a franchise executive, scaling out a company called Swiss Farms. Long story short, uh, the you know the, there's a book called Who Moved My Cheese. My cheese got moved. I had to find another opportunity. I settled on property management because it was a service based business that could be scaled, that could be profitable if ran well, that couldn't be outsourced, that did well regardless of the economy. And yeah. I decided to double down on property management, which is uh, takes a lot of experience to do it well. It's taken 15 years of experience to build out a team, and right now we run about. 1500 rental units and right now i own about 100 of those yeah it's interesting you telling that story of the college thing i said the same thing when i dropped my daughter off at school i'm like you know what you should do with your money you should go and buy a, a place and rent it out to your friends and then jump and jump and jump and i don't know if she really liked the conversation because she was quick out the car to school and i was like okay cool was she fourth like, grade how old is she <laughs> no she's graduating <laughs> she's graduating so um, 18, trying to figure out life, right? Yeah. And I said, this is where we have the conversation. You know, she's been watching me do real estate for a decade. And now it's time to say, hey, look, you're about to be 18. You're going to probably rent somewhere. And if you're smart about it, it can be from yes. yourself and your friends can rent from you. And, you know, in, in 10 years, you could have a hundred grand in equity just by doing right. nothing, but, you know, doing it right. And the other thing that was interesting about what you said at the end there was, you know, my mentor would always say, there's two ways to make money in this world, doing things people don't want to do, and they don't know how to do. And when you look at property right. management, that's both, you know, people don't mm. want to do it. And while they may feel like they can do it, uh, there's a lot that goes into yes. effective property management. So when, you know, before, before the call, you were talking about workforce housing. Yes. What is that? I've never heard that term before. What is workforce housing? Sure. So right now in America, it is cost prohibitive to build multifamily that mm -hmm. would rent to anybody besides like basically you need to build luxury and yeah. rent it for a very high price per square foot. So mm -hmm. there's that avatar, right? I have a good job. I have great credit you know, all day Sports long, $2,500, two bedroom. Yeah, the whole That's right. Parking that. lot, pool, gym, podcast, whatever they're, whatever they're putting in those amenities. They have to get a certain, it's all mat. They have to get a certain mm -hmm. price per square foot. Then the flip side of that is subsidized housing. Okay. So subsidized housing, you need some grants, you need help from the government, right? And yeah. what in between, it's workforce. So it's a workforce housing where I'm not on Section 8, but my need to rent properties similarly priced to where Section 8 price is theirs. Mm -hmm. And some landlords don't want to deal with workforce. 
or market rate because it's not guaranteed by the government. So that's a bit mm -hmm. of a challenge. So we we like that sector. We like to help out. And we do have some luxury and we do have some uh, subsidized. But a lot of what we have are are in areas where they're building brand new luxury complexes for, let's say, $2,500 a month for a two-bedroom, and my mm -hmm. bedroom might be brand new, renovated, but on the on the structure of an older building, so my taxes are a little less, my insurance might be a little less, my acquisition costs were, were, were less, I have the old world charm, and I can rent that same apartment for, let's say, $1,500 to $1,800. Now, it's not going to have a Starbucks on the first floor, and nope. you it might have one parking spot, not two, and the hallways might be a little narrower, right? And it's not going to have a fancy name and a fancy sign, but it's going to be a high-quality place to live where everything works. It's going to have good property management behind it, and it's going to it's going to work within your budget. That's what I would call that that affordable workforce housing. Yeah, for the average person – that's going to maybe have a job at Amazon and, you know, someone else is working at the hospital. They don't want to be throwing, maybe they're trying to like save for a house and then $2,500 yes. a month they could afford maybe, but that's all, that's it. You know, they're putting 40% of their income to housing and that's just not future sustainable. Right. That's right. So do, do you want to know one of the number one things that I do to get to, to take a building and turn it into that? Yeah. That would be, I look at it on what am I paying per, per square foot and how many apartments can I fit there per square foot? And I've had some municipalities approve micro apartments. So I yeah. will build 300 square, 350 square foot apartments with full kitchen, full bathroom, and a bedroom, a living room, a closet, a stackable washer, dryer, right? Or an all-in-one mm -hmm. unit. And usually what I can do is I can take a – a regular sized, almost oversized two bedroom. Yeah. Cut it right down the middle and give myself two two one bedrooms. I need to have parking, need to have a certain amount of pervious. Not every municipality is interested in that, but that mm -hmm. is one way. Uh that is one way to do it. So that way it usually only costs, you know, call it forty thousand dollars to add a bathroom and add a kitchen that wasn't already there. Mm -hmm. So the appraiser comes back, the appraisal comes back seventy five to a hundred thousand dollars per unit. So I can make my numbers work if I can take a irregular size space, cut it in half and 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 increase density that way. So that's where the redevelopment comes in. Many times that can take over a year to get approved. So mm -hmm. I will keep residents in the building through that entire time, but I will let them know, look, like, the, like we might be giving you notice. Here's another apartment that we have available. So continue to pay your rent, take care of the apartment, abide by the lease, be a good neighbor. We'll work with you. Yeah. Like it's coming down the pipe. That's interesting too, because like a lot of people are not super keen on that expansion or that like, maybe they're like, Oh, I can turn the old maintenance room into one more unit, but they're not really about cutting it down or, Yes. redevelopment you know we did we did a an apartment is 12 units and they were all ones but the group kind of group home we were renting to wanted twos so we did you know reconfigure move the kitchen to the other side yes. put in that other room and do the extra work that people don't really want to do but because we qualified for the tenant everything made sense Smart. they paid a lot and then they actually ended up buying the building um nice. in the end so the micro unit thing, do you get a lot of pushback? Is it more often or more – is it more often you get it or not? I'm 50-50 right now. Yeah. Well, so my, I mean, my, the, the, it's getting better as to how I present it. I have I have a architect that's done work for Toll Brothers Commercial. They do these types of apartments, and it seems like if I can get them 350, 400 square feet, I'm okay. Below the 300, people just start scratching their head. They're like, that's a big living room and somebody's going to live there. And yeah, they do. you're absolutely right, Bryce. If you can flip a bedroom with a kitchen and have it so you enter the home or apartment in the kitchen, that's your common area. Mm -hmm. Now, on either side of it is a bedroom. So mm -hmm. three rooms can go from being a single bedroom, right? Kitchen, living room, bedroom to just kitchen in the center with a living room, all one room. 
people aren't cooking like they used to. You no. don't need to have all this countertop and all these cabinets. And one person living by themselves is not roasting a chicken every no, night. It's, I, I, right. I was talking to this one guy. He was uh, He's a property owner, landlord. But he's also a restaurateur. Like he owns mm. restaurants in in Winnipeg here, and he said, he said, Bryce, the future is people won't cook anymore. Wow. So when you look at it, you know, I was in Cleveland in 2019, and they had all these like redeveloped warehouse units. So you come in, yes. and there's a bedroom, yes. and then like a living room kind of kitchen area. But at the bottom of the building, and this was all like 20 somethings living in this thing, like core core Cleveland, where no one else really wanted to live. Okay. At the bottom was a grocery store, but they had a buffet. So in the morning it was breakfast and at lunch it was lunch and at dinner it was dinner. So people came into the building, got food, went to their unit. When the morning went down, got food left for work. Yes. So the, you're right. You know, people aren't cooking like they used to and you, you don't need a huge, you know, eight foot uh, countertop. You need a sink and a microwave area. That's and, right. Maybe a dishwasher, no sink, and just jam it all in there. Yep. So yeah, air fryer maybe. Unit, and yeah, you yeah. Know, well, the micro the units are interesting too because you know, people would have kind of like boff, bo balked at that a little bit. They say, Oh, who's gonna live in 300 square feet? But you look at how people live now, and they might work because people are working like 12, 14 hours. They're not nine to five in it, they're like nine right. to nine in it. Yes. So they get home, they got their food with them. They sit down, they might That's eat it. on their bed, pass out, go to work. Uh, it's changing. People are looking for closets. They're not looking for apartments. So mm. the micro unit, I think the, the biggest challenge, you know, and I've tried to push these here in, in Winnipeg is the municipality doesn't want, they, they're just like, and it's usually a board of like 60, 70, 80 year old guys yes. sitting around going, that's not an apartment. And it's like, okay, well, That's it. as you. You know, what about what do my 20 year old working class people want? Well, they want an affordable house that they can spend, you know, 20 hours a month at because they're either That's at it. their girlfriend's place, at school, at work, not at home. That's it. So, so I'll give a quick plug. Yeah. I did one season of a podcast called Living Well with Rent Well. There's 56, 58 episodes out there. The, the first episode I did was with a borough council president. In the, in the states, you have these. You have states and then counties and then townships and municipalities and boroughs and towns and cities and all these different names. So he's the borough council president. And he's a real estate guy, and he's helped turn around this entire town. The whole town was vacant on the first floor commercial, an old steel town. Now it's all full. Only took about a half a decade. Low interest rates helped. Couple of developers like myself helped, but he actually gets into when he's investing. What questions does he ask when he's calling the town? Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between being the fifty percent that'll approve it versus not. Because I've spent nine months and twenty thousand dollars to get something approved. Everybody in the town seemed to like it. Then you get to that three person zoning board. And actually, this is how the podcast found me because I lit a little bit of a fire. I've, I've, you know. You can create a lot with fire. You just got to be careful how you direct it. But I had a I had a, a post go viral uh, about what just happened here, city of Coatesville. Like I was ready to turn take an old building that hasn't seen love in fifty years and bring it back to life and actually net new to apartments, and I got denied. And you know, the, so anyway, I just wanted to say. For this is a really important part for anybody who's looking to redevelop. If you're not looking to redevelop, not as big of a not as big of a deal. If you just want to throw some paint and some flooring down and maybe spruce up the outside, redevelopment isn't as important. But at the same time, the towns that are going to redevelop and that are going to change with the times, those are the ones that I want to be in. Well, and and the other thing that came to mind when you were saying that, I was thinking with the price per square foot or rather as some people would do unit based pricing mm -hmm. when you know the number one thing i hear time and time again is like i'm waiting for the price to come down to buy this unit i'm waiting for i'm waiting for yeah. it doesn't pan out it's not the funding the the interest rate i can't buy this multi unit cuz yes. xyz doesn't math it doesn't right. math that's right and if you're willing to go and do that densification it might just pen it might just actually calculate to a profitable deal but you got to be 
You know, you got to have yes. vision for, for the space because otherwise you're probably going to be locked out. You're probably going to be locked out of the market unless you're willing to get creative. Right now, I'm working three times as hard for half the results to find a deal. Mm -hmm. And I am putting everything at it. Can it be co-living? Can it be a short-term rental? Can it be, uh, can it be, you know, traveling nurses? Um, are there any grants available? And it, and it comes down to, I'm buying price per square foot. I'm buying a certain acreage, right? I'm buying the overall lot square foot. How many parking spots could it have? Is there a, is there a lot next to it? I had an hour long conversation with a neighbor yesterday for this four unit I'm buying and, just talking about the driveway and if I could maybe get some sort of an easement, could I give her, if I could buy the neighbor's house, could I give her more backyard? And I just, I'll work with people. So renting well and having a profitable management company without sacrificing your values is like communicating mm -hmm. and being okay to put yourself out there and reimagining what these properties could be. Cause right now I can't build new construction Nobody and can. feel comfortable going through land development and, and everything else. And I know I'm not the only one. So I like to take the old tire and inventory and bring it back to life. Yeah. I mean, even in, even in this market here, we haven't been able to like calculate profitable new construction mm. since like 2018, like Canada, yeah. just now in Canada, we have a program called MLI select where the government is subsidizing the construction based on a point system of affordability and eco-friendliness. So there yeah. is, that's how um, their plan is to support these, these new constructions that just don't make sense on paper. You're like, do the math. You're like, I'm hundreds of thousands of dollars yes. locked in this deal. It doesn't make sense. doesn't make sense. So um, now here's the other challenge. They'll put overlay districts. They did this in West Philadelphia. New mayors wanted to get elected. They want the people's votes. We're going to help build affordable housing. Not a single deal is penciled. You can't even look at it because what they did is they said, in this region, you have to rent a certain amount of apartments in that building for this amount per unit. Mm -hmm. And the unit economics don't work. And when you understand what the economics are in terms of the cost of capital, the cost of construction, and the returns – if we could just – one of the things that I'm going to be doing is spending some time at the city level to just educate and yeah, say, let say me explain like, this to you. Let me let me so just explain this to you. Right? They're so disconnected from the numbers of what affordable housing – because it almost feels like they have these landlords. Like they're giving this grants out and on some level kind of imprisoning the property owner to manage subsidized housing because sure. – they're going to pull the grant or they're going to pull the thing if you don't fulfill the thing. So we've got our thumb on you, but you can have our money. And it's just like, what's happening is people are actually not going the affordable housing, right? They're going the like uh, retrofitting, like making sure it's energy efficient. That's more okay. appealing than the low rent. Got it. Like, just making like a low rent building. People aren't going that way. They're going like, oh, I'm going to make the roof better i'm gonna insulate it and that's okay. how i'm gonna get the points so there's ways around it but mm. like you're saying it feels like that it always seems to feel like at the municipal level and up that they have very little maybe not very little i'm sure there's highly educated housing people in there but the politicians telling us about affordable housing uh, seem to be a little bit removed from what that actually means that's right and how zoning that, boards are first. typically volunteer from the area older and not not necessarily with it and have a vision for how they think it should be and they're not in the one they're not the ones in the paint they're not the ones that are having a hard time finding a new place to live if you just increase housing it the, it, it it helps everybody well what do you mean what kind of housing any housing dude just just more housing, put up a please. small tent city like it will help because it's all about supply and demand and the fundamentals of economics and and we're we're not we're not ready for it yet. Right. And, and the other thing too that's like there's there are options that we could easily, you know, you could build modular or this and that and yes. the other and 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 stack these units up and bring these things to market relatively quickly. Do you think that the city wants that building? No, nope, they're not interested because it's not 
conventional construction. Yeah. It's not bricks and wood and sticks. It's, you know, something new and new, new might be scary or something. Yes. I don't know. There's ways to solve it that aren't really. Um, and that's one <laughs> my mentor used to say, the government is ill-suited for housing. That's why mm, they need investors to do it. You know, well, if you could solve parking, number one pushback that I get is parking. And the misconception is that more apartments equals more parking. And it's not true because that for this particular project, the second and third floor of this beautiful old home is over 1,500 square feet. And it's a kitchen, a bathroom, and everything else is a room. Mm -hmm. Depending on who I rent it to, they could have a dozen people living there. Mm -hmm. Multiple families, probably four to six adults, probably, probably four cars. And on the street. if I could just split it, I'd probably only have two cars. Mm -hmm. Just so, so that's a if there's the, you know the the parking is a challenge because a lot of these types of buildings that I'm buying are in more more dense areas. So then you you know the municipality has to step up, get some grants, get a parking lot going, or 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 have some vision to build a garage, and then people will walk a little bit further, or you can. So you have to get creative with it. By the and it's a challenge. House. Oh yeah, there's some areas right. that there's just no parking. You're gonna have to like make a deal with the parkade down the street because there's just no option. That's it's right. like grid to grid, old construction, 19, you know, 20, and it's just yes. right to the sidewalk, brick straight up. That's it's it. Like, no, there's no parking here. That's right. Never will be. There wasn't when it was built. It's just not gonna happen. So when you look at Rentwell's approach to property management renovations to maximize value of investment yes. while maintaining that standards, uh, you know, to provide quality service, how does that work into what we were talking about before about you don't really trade on cap rates. You you kind of work on this like dollars per square thing. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the property management, your guiding light as far as like investment goes, how do you make, because a lot of people are not doing that calculation that way. That's right. So, you know, try to make it make sense to the rest of us who are working on cap rates and and things of that nature. So your question is, how do I look at it differently? Yeah. How do you look at the the building? We've talked a little about the square footage, but through the whole process, you buy it, you do some numbers. We talked about the CapEx expense. You're trying to go all the way. And then- to the end of it, how do we provide that quality of service to the residents while still okay. making the numbers work? All right. How much time do we have? I'll be as succinct as five I can. Minutes. Five, five minutes. Five solid minutes. I'll give you First five thing I do is my criteria page. And I have a workbook for this, and, and, and this will get put in the book. The book's a couple years away. Uh, so I look at parking, electric, HVAC, closets, character, community, taxes, walkability, path of progress, flood zones, laundry, outdoor spaces. Can it be Section 8? Is there any space planning, fire escapes? Like that's all criteria that gets green, yellow, red. Red is it won't happen. Green is it's already there. Yellow is it could be. Then I do look at potential gross rents. And then I say 50% operating expenses on that building because I don't – I don't trust their operating expenses. They don't have management, yeah. maintenance, everything else. So I will look at a cap rate in that regard. And then I have like a sliding scale that says, if I can get the ex the operating expenses lower and what's the, what, because I, I typically do, then what is the, and then I have, so basically cap rate across the top, uh, operate, you know, operating expenses across the top, cap rate along the bottom. There's my sliding scale. Then I look at my deals that I've done. On average, I buy for eighty-four dollars a square foot. On average, on average, I've renovated for seventy-eight dollars a square foot. I have some holding cost in that. It ends up being about two hundred dollars a square foot when I'm all said and done, in terms of value. Mm -hmm. And uh, that deal that works for me all day long. You can pretty much call that a big league burr. And when the interest rates lower, you know it'll it'll get it get even easier if that's if that's the uh, if that's the way that things go. So that the first part of your question was lead comes in. Ooh, that looks like a big building. What's the square footage? Mm -hmm. What's the square footage of the lot? How much of the building is apartments? Typically 75% can be living space. The other 25% is common areas. It's those types of things that I'm that I'm looking at. 
Occasionally, I'll send it to an architect and say, hey, I'm really interested in this one. Let me know what you think. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll contact the owner, and I do a bunch of postcards. So it, here's hap happens to be one. So I'll my picture, my business partner, an old ugly building, right? Like Some I reasons said, to sell still, to us. We still want to buy. We're sending this until they call. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you never go off our list. We still want to buy. And Bryce, from there, site visit, bring a Matterport camera because – I need to be able to do the space planning and start looking at parking plans and space planning plans. I do all of that. And then I'm like, all right, how much can I really afford to pay for this thing? Cause I'm not, I can't, it's not about driving the price down. It's how high up can I go? Cause it's still a seller's market where I am. Yeah. And, and the rents are good, which means people don't need to sell. Occupancy is, is very, is very strong. So from there, the, the better, and then that that could be a two year process when it's all said and done. Until until my management company gets the building, they're getting it with. Here's the meters on every apartment because we will install our own water meters. Here's mm -hmm. the paint color that was used throughout. Here is here's where the extra glue down vinyl strips are because that's the flooring we use. No more luxury vinyl planks snapped together. It's all glue down strips. Yeah, and. That's that like so that's what we do. When when we hand it out to Rentwell, then Rentwell is responsible for the lease up. So then they're doing some virtual staging. They might host an open house. They they already knew that this was coming, hopefully. So they're doing some coming soon. And we leverage a software called Show Mojo, which helps to notify anybody who was interested within mm -hmm. the last year of a property that met similar criteria. And then it's big into the screening right now about a third of applications are coming through with like false information on them just people yeah. trying to squeeze a little bit more oh i'm a tasker and this extra money comes in well that's fine does it go into a bank account good yeah well this ai software is going to screen going to going to scrape your bank account and 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 make sure that what you say lines up because i'm worried about the next recession and i'm worried about some controls on evictions and that would that those two things aren't going to play well for landlords. It's going to play well if you have some capital and some dry powder to buy some buildings. Because there will be yeah. landlords in trouble if that happens again without a big bailout. So mm -hmm. I just gave a lot in a short period of time, but that is a process that I that I follow, and I go. I I have like a few wells in in a few towns that I buy in, and the number one source for me to find properties to manage or properties to buy because I'm I'm good with either or or to redevelop and partner with somebody is I go to I look on the MLS to see who's selling and who's buying who were those agents and I will reach out to those agents mm -hmm. and I'll introduce myself and let them know that I can protect their commission and more than 50% of the time I'm getting a phone call from somebody because the brokers need they need good property right. managers yeah, and property managers, yeah. That's right. So that's that's how I do it. And it's a full-time job. This is this is my profession, right? It's like Sparta 300. Mm -hmm. Right? Where he's this like, yeah, if he kicks the yeah. guy in the well and then he's like, who, you know, I thought you'd bring more soldiers and no, I brought more soldiers than you. Mhm. Mm right? These are professionals. That's it. So you you know you're the second person today to talk about AI screening. Ah. Because, you know, like that's been, that's been the, uh, I call it the landlord finesse where they're trying to mm. finesse their way in, you know, they look great. They, they say all the right things and, you know, they give you the paperwork that you, that you want to see. And they're trying to finesse their way into your building. Yes. And the, a human can be finessed a little bit, you know, the, la the leasing agent be like, I got a good feeling about these people. Right. It's maybe not completed and fully, but you know, they got the cash, they're ready to move in. Yes. And then the AI software says like, no, it's, you know, does yeah. its thing. And, and what's interesting is this is a, this is a company out of uh, Texas that's managing 5,500 units. Got it. And they said with the AI screening at the front, they actually save, so much time because the leasing agents aren't wasting their time with people that aren't qualified. So they found that like a third of applications don't even need to be dealt with. Mm. The AI goes, nope, nope, nope. Yes. And 
you know, I, I think that, I think that that's the more, the more that you can utilize, like we're seeing it in real estate all across the board. I think when AI really touched a couple of years ago, let's say it was a couple of years ago, but it's been around. The more that we figure out how to use it to generate results in real estate, the better we're going to be at profitability, feasibility, mm. um, and ultimately like smoothing out the business. The more that we can, because I always say that AI is great at doing what it's told. Humans are terrible at doing what mm. they're told. You know, can you trust? Can you trust the property management screening process, or can you trust the AI screening process? Mm -hmm. And which one's going to be ruthless and which one's going to have a heart? Mm. Um, it's going to be the AI that, you know, like cold calling, for instance, who's better cold calling? Who's going to get emotions and be like, what's going to happen if they pick up the phone, the AI cold caller or the human cold caller, you know? So it's like the more we can utilize these systems, I think, I don't think it's going to remove jobs. I think it's going to increase profitability mm. overall. Um, I don't know much about it. We 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 use that you know that that software in terms of some of the other things. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it evolves. You have one thing is for sure. You have to keep your finger on the pulse if you're if you're putting out this technology. You 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 have to really understand. I mean, my business is such a business of finesse. If we miss one connection point, eventually it will be exposed as to what what went wrong and i could be I'm, I'm talking about water meter i'm talking about a outlet i'm all the way into you know the right screening and making sure that it's not violating fair housing and 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 it's a tool that 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 it's going to have a person behind it that hopefully knows how to use it well yeah. and and it's and and it's here the genie's out of the box we're gonna we're gonna work with it <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh times are changing so always are you know, you got the property management, you're looking for apartment blocks. Are you, are you localized or are you looking to expand across the country or is it just, you know, where you want to be is where you want to be? Well, at one point I, I was in five States with the rent. Well, we sold those offices and we put the, we put the capital into real estate. So right now we're in Philadelphia market and then, and then, and then Pittsburgh, it's both Pennsylvania. It's one lease. We run two teams that, so the short answer is, no, not right now. Could I help somebody else that wanted to duplicate what I'm doing in another city? And if they're at the level where they've already owned some properties and they they really understand what it takes to be a landlord and they want to go to the next level, could we set up some sort of a joint venture or some coaching or something like that? Yep, yeah, probably. I do that from time to time. I want people to be successful. Somebody like me, uh, you, you can't beat me because I want you to win. Mm -hmm. there right? You go, yeah. You know, if there's multiple redevelopers in a town, the town's going to go, um, you know, look better, nicer, faster, and it's going to help everybody else. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you can't beat me because I want you to win. I help out local property management. There's there's a half a dozen firms that'll text me, hey, my broker says this. I can't. I'm a property manager, and I can't go to court. I said, well, my broker's never told me that, and this is the form that you know the court would have you sign if you were going to. Oh, get, thanks so much. All right, so. That's just uh, that. That's kind of who I am. I think that's also part. Maybe it ends up being a chapter in the book. Renting well, how to grow a profitable management company without sacrificing your values. Right? It's like that go giver mentality. That that rising tide lifts all ships. So yeah, I'd love to help other people. That that one of those first properties I bought, Bryce. That you, as you were, your daughter was getting out of the car, and you said, "Hey." This house hacking, and this is what it is. Yeah. We all, we all know that she listened to somebody else over her own father. Unfortunately, <laughs> the, the doors are anything like mine. I'll get someone else to tell her. That's it. Maybe she'll listen to this episode. Yeah. And I refinanced a house. I did that. I lived in a home. I refinanced fifteen years later. Pulled out my half of equity and bought a beach house with somebody else, with a buddy and his family. So now we have a beautiful beach house that we can actually use in the summers. Mm -hmm. And that's when it really clicked for me, Bryce, when I was like, okay, this is real. Because yeah. you need to know your balance sheet. Every Most of my loans, it is about $10 a month in additional principal paid down than the prior month. It's like 8 to $10 for these types of like, like a million-dollar loan. Take a million-dollar loan. 
do a do a 25 year amortization schedule from one month to the next it's only about eight dollars in principal that you're an additional principal but what that means is it's 150 dollars that first year mm -hmm. from the first payment to the last and it accelerates as that so this is a balance sheet gain this is a i know how to get rich through the crock pot mm -hmm. way to wealth Eight, and eight hours, the slow cooker. And, and yes, you know, people, are, and that's interesting for people listening at, at, back at home and whatever. There's a lot of people that are going to say that you can get rich in real estate in the next 90 days. Okay. And there's, and there's some ways that you can make some like fast cash, you know, wholesaling or, you know, yeah. get into, you can build a sub two portfolio, but nothing will ever outperform time in the market. Nothing will ever outperform that over, you know, just stay in, stay, mm. you know, die in the market, you mm. know, write it off to someone else, die in the market, never sell. And you'll be, you know, you'll be all right. So if people want to connect with you, they want to find out more, they want to pick your brain, what should they do? How do they find you? Uh, Email is the best way and our website. So when, uh, rentwell.com there's actually a button there that you can click for a 15 minute free to consultation connection conversation with rob mm -hmm. and then my email is rob at rentwell.com awesome man i really appreciate you stopping by kind of putting on a master class here for us we let it run a little bit but i appreciate the time man appreciate you bryce all right until next time guys we'll catch you on the next episode Hey there, I really hope you enjoyed that episode. And as always, if you want to listen to more daily interview content, make sure you subscribe. And if you're an active real estate investor and you're doing deals and you'd like to get featured on this show, then just head over to DaveInterviewsYou.com. Now at MoneyPartnerFormula.com, we help real estate investors to create a process for predictably getting capital so they can do more deals without relying on hard money lenders or the banks. We do this by building them a private capital marketing system. Now, if you want help turning yourself into a big money capital attraction machine, then book a call with our team to see how we can help. Just visit moneypartnerformula.com to find out more. All right, take care and we'll see you on the next interview.